thank you so much for coming. And on behalf also of Leonardo and I, who, and especially Caroline Barra, I'm not sure where she is, but she's the one who's done all the work. I think she's outside, still working. We really are just so happy that you're all here. And she, of course, is just such an honor to have you again. She also hosted us for the final event of FinOff, which was a three-year project uh, coordinated by myself with seven other institutions on finance, innovation, and growth. And so for us, it's just so important to now add the word inequality, social inclusion, equity in that formula. So we don't just talk about you know, what innovation needs in terms of the finance it receives, but also what kind of growth do we actually want. We don't just want smart, is this on, uh, innovation-led growth. We also want inclusive growth. This is a very trendy word, by the way, that's being used across the world by, say, the OECD, the European Commission. They talk about smart, inclusive, sustainable growth. But one of our, um, I think, shared opinions here is that in order to talk about that, you have to, for example, have a reason, have a theory, but also have an analysis of why it is that, for example, in the 1990s, we had plenty of growth, plenty of innovation, but in fact, inequality rose extremely quickly. You know, what is that relationship? What is the relationship between innovation and inequality, which uh, for some of, of you who actually studied, say, the history of economic thought, you'll know that people like David Ricardo, Karl Marx, so the classical, pre-neoclassical economists thought about this a lot. So, you know, the famous chapter on machinery of David Ricardo, where, when he was looking at mechanization, which was the way that innovation was happening at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, the first thing he did was then ask, well, what's the relationship then with the profit-wage ratio? Which again, if any of you have looked at that ratio recently, it's extremely depressing, just how much profits have completely outpaced wages. But there's really a paucity out there of debate about what this relationship is about. And the few people who are talking about it around the world, and by the way, there's plenty of mainstream economists talking about it, are really focusing on the issue of skills, right? That some people are being left behind, for example, by the IT revolution. And I think that one of the things that different ones of us are going to be touching on today is that skills really doesn't explain, for example, the difference between, you know, the 1% and the 99%, which we know is at the basis of lots of demonstrations around the world. We think this is much more about the ability of certain agents in the economy really to extract a lot of value. And in order to talk about value extraction, though, you really need a theory of where does value come from in, you know, in the first place. And this, too, is something that we think economists would really benefit from. Um, and policymakers, who are often slaves of defunct economists, as Keynes said, to really go back to, which is to start debating again, you know, different theories of value creation. And this is something I think that our group here is really going to contribute to, because I think the unique aspect of the speakers that you're going to be hearing today is that we somehow combine the real interest, again, in innovation-led smart growth, but also thinking about reforming finance, but not just in terms of things like business angels and venture capital and different types of funding for innovation, but what is finance in the first place? What is money? Is it just a medium of exchange or is it something else? And so this ability or, how do you say, attempt to really bring together people who are really thinking about money and finance and capitalism, what is it about? So we have both Jan Kregel and Randy Ray here, who I would say are the, you know, two of the most important people around the world thinking about this. So money beyond a medium of exchange with, others who are really thinking very seriously and are at the cutting edge of really thinking about innovation. I just want to really say three things because I don't want to take up much time. First is really to echo Chi's um, very sensible words about the context we're in. And I talk to ministers quite a bit on both sides of government in the UK. And they all have on the tip of their tongue this issue that we have to rebalance, right? We have to rebalance the economy. Why? Well, if you look at any of the data coming out of the Bank of England, you'll know why. And by the way, Andy Haldane, who I was hoping would be here but he couldn't come, um, has some of the best data on this. He's shown how finance has completely outpaced right, the real economy. And so this issue of rebalancing from you know, all this value extracted from financial intermediation to nurturing the real economy is a very hot topic, I think, on both sides of government. But I think what's often missed in this debate is realizing just how financialized the real economy is. So it's not about big bad hedge funds, derivatives, credit default swaps, and the great industry manufacturing real economy. It's also about reforming how this real economy is working because it's basically just as bad as the banks. That's my first point, which I think is really important to remember because sometimes we confuse 
you know, finance with, um, you know, how bad it is, which we know, you know, all sorts of problems have existed, but we, it's easy then to place, how do you say, a romanticized version of what it means then to do industrial policy. And if we do have a very sick real economy, then industrial policy, if it's seen as just, say, feeding this great industry, you're actually feeding a very sick system, potentially. And I think Bill's going to talk to you about how sick that system is, Bill Izanik. The other point is, you know, we often talk about, and again, this is just coming from my um, observations when I talk to these ministers, we often hear that there's some sort of credit crunch, there's a lack of finance. Well, that's just not true. There's plenty of finance out there. It's just the wrong type of finance. Now, anyone who's looked at innovation around the world, from Silicon Valley to China today, which I think Leonardo is going to talk about a bit, the China question, you really realize that the kind of finance that innovation actually needs is patient, long-term, committed finance. That's what we have too little of, not finance. It's a very different way to talk about it. And in fact, what's interesting is, in fact, this variety of different types of patient finance that we can learn from around the world, from in the US, you know, the NIH, National Institutes of Health, with just in 2012, spent $31 billion just on biotech and pharma, providing that patient, long-term committed finance, to, as we know, DARPA's you know, example of the internet. But around the world, what we've seen is also the increasing role of, say, state investment banks. And I'm very happy that we have a representative here today from BNDS, uh, Brazil State Investment Bank. And what we see in looking at these state investments banks is that they're increasing the amount of finance that they actually have to provide to innovative firms, innovative sectors, precisely because private finance has withdrawn. Now, how we then are going to judge their performance, and we know that they're constantly attacked for crowding out private finance, should actually be able to take that into consideration. If you just think of these state investment banks as, say, aiding the development process, um, you know, funding infrastructure, or providing counter-cyclical funding, and don't realize just how much they're actually transforming the innovation and industrial landscape, by the way, some state investment banks, not the one, for example, in Italy, where I'm from, which is it's playing a very passive role, and I'm talking with them about, you know, thinking about that. Anyway, that actually then requires a change in the metrics we use to actually look at their performance. And that's a whole new area that I think really is starving for research. And it's interesting, I was in um, Brazil with a bunch of these people here uh, recently, and just one day that I was there, there was 30 articles in the Brazilian papers about BNDS crowding out private finance. Then you start looking at what BNDS is doing, say, in pharma, biotech, and clean tech, and they're investing in precisely the areas that private finance is too risk averse to fund. Um, but that seems to go unnoticed. Anyway, the other thing is, in order to talk about these things really in terms of policy relevance and really joining up policy, so we're not just talking about innovation, we're not just talking about financial reform, we're really talking about the macro economy and how to really nurture the kind of growth we want, it actually requires kind of talking about everything, even competition policy, for example. You know, Huawei, number one today in telecommunications in the world, even without the US market, which they've been blocked out of, received a massive loan from the China Development Bank. This is called anti-competitive. Now, if competition is what Schumpeter said it was, which is firms trying to differentiate themselves through innovation, and if innovation requires patient, long-term, committed finance, and if that patient finance is increasingly coming from the public sector, then that might actually have to start influencing how we think of competition policy. And lastly, you know, and the reason we're here is that we absolutely must stop this divide, which I alluded to in the beginning, where we just have labor economists thinking about, you know, inequality and, and the whole skills issue, and then we have people like some of us here in this room who are the innovation economists thinking about, you know, pushing the frontier and innovation-led growth. We really have to join it up. And this really is also about noticing that one of the biggest sicknesses, in fact, coming back to the sickness of the economy, that people have alluded to in terms of finance is, in fact, this issue of socialization of risk and privatization of reward, right, which many people have used to accuse what's happened in finance. So when things were good, you know, Goldman Sachs made mega money. When things went bad, they didn't really have to pay. The state came in and bailed out all these banks. Well, in fact, this is just as true, again, in the real economy. I mean, one of the things I've tried to do with the book I've written, which is, is you know, echoing also work of others, also funded by Ford, including Fred Block, this great book he wrote with uh, Matthew Keller, The State of Innovation, is noticing just the incredible role that the state has actually played in the value creation process. So again, in order to limit the kind of inequality that we're seeing increasing, we really have to start linking our 
accusations of rent seeking, of the speculators, or using Ed Miliband's word, predatory versus productive capital. So these critiques, if you want, that are about value extraction to a theory of value creation and the role that different actors play in that value creation process, including the state, and as we'll hear from Bill, not only. Um, and I just want to you know, close there and just as a, had a challenge, if you want, to really not think about this just in terms of reforming finance, but reforming macro policy, innovation policy, finance policy, competition policy together. And what is the objective is growth that is smart, inclusive, and sustainable. And with those words, I will leave off to Leonardo, <laughs> who will tell you about the great projects.